All right, so yeah, thanks everyone for being here. I know that there's currently an NHGRI talk going on in the other room, so I understand if, um, if that's competing with attendance for this one, but um, I think we have some really good papers to present. Uh, so like um, was just stated, my name is Joe Romano. I am at Columbia University currently, uh, and I'm going to be at the University of Pennsylvania starting a postdoc soon. So, um, and you'll notice that there's a lot of different authors on this paper from different institutions, so I'll get to that later on. So the title of this paper that we published was A Decade of Translational Bioinformatics, a Retrospective Analysis of Year and Review Presentations. And as the name suggests, uh, this is looking at translational bioinformatics year and reviews from previous AMES summits. And so those of you who've been here for multiple years will probably uh, most most likely remember those presentations because they've always been a great highlight of the conference, uh, delivered by Russ Altman usually at the end of the TBI portion. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to come up with a quantitative and qualitative retrospective analysis of the data generated by those year in review sessions to see what we can learn about translational bioinformatics and what types of things we can do to help advance the field. And so I have no disclosures to make. And here are the three learning objectives. I'll just read them quickly. So uh, after participating in the session, you should better be able to understand the patterns learned by aggregating 11 TBI year review sessions. You should be able to conceptualize the algorithm we use to determine popularity bursts in publication data. And we should also be able to target future research in TBI to leverage underrepresented topics that were exposed by the year review sessions. So for those of you who weren't at any of the, these previous year in review sessions, here's a quick summary of what they were. So these sessions occurred once a year at the TBI Summit, so this same conference, from 2008 through 2018. This is the first year that there is not one of these sessions. Uh, and these were run to highlight major trends and specific papers that were important to translational bioinformatics over that previous year. And they included Dr. Russ Altman's interpretations and predictions for the future. So these were run by Dr. Altman at, uh, at Stanford University, and he's one of the fathers of the field, so he has great insights on uh, the work that's going on and what's going to happen in the future. Uh, these presentations included material that was sourced by peer nomination and later on in their history uh, from manual curation assisted by student volunteers. So I was on that uh, board for a number of years. So I was introduced to this in that fashion. And these year in review presentations have inspired several other lines of AMIA year in review sessions, including one that would be at the, the uh, fall symposium and some CRI year in review sessions and others as well. So all of the slides that, you, uh, that, that Dr. Altman posted for these are available publicly, so you can go to his blog and find those and do the reanalysis and read through them if you want to learn more about it. Moving on, though, here's what our data looks like. So our data included 441 PubMed Index Year in Review papers, which is almost all of the papers that were in there. There were several bioarchive papers that we couldn't include due to lack of article metrics. And these come from 90 distinct journals, and they were published between March 2007 through March 2018, so spanning the range of those year in review session coverage. And we compared these to 730,000 non-year in review papers, and those are papers that came from the same 90 journals that produced year in review papers over the same range of time. And so you can see some very simple summary statistics related to the counts uh, in these data on the screen. So um, the first panel there, panel A, you can't probably read the text on it, but you can see that Panel A and Panel C, which is the year in review article versus the background articles, had a relatively similar shape. You can see that there is a slight difference in the shape of the year in review article session because of differences in the amount of time and resources that were available to be dedicated to it. And then on the panel on the right hand side, you can see the most popular journals arranged in descending order within the year in review corpus. So here's what the most common uh, journals represented there are, and you can see that it makes sense for translational bioinformatics. Importantly, Jamia is at the top, so we're doing a great job of representing AMIA work, AMIA related work, uh, and the other things make sense as well. PLOS computational biology, bioinformatics, science and nature are all things that you would expect to see there. And so with these data, we performed three different dimensions of analysis. So the first of these is using medical subject heading terms. And so what MeSH terms are is they are categorical labels that are applied manually to articles that are in PubMed. 
uh, by indexers at the National Library of Medicine. So these are great for performing lots of analyses on the topics covered by different documents. Uh, and what these did for us is they allowed us a high level overview of year and review documents versus background documents using the frequencies of those terms. And we also use these to uh, interpret the importances of these terms in the context of year and review using L1 regularized or LASSO logistic regression. So we'll get to that later. The second dimension of analysis we used was using these altmetric attention score distributions. And what altmetric scores are is they are a measure that aggregates various different uh, uh, different metrics that quantify the amount of attention that has been experienced in the media related to a paper as well as citations and other things. Um, and we use this to compare attention score distributions and time periods relative to these things that we call bursts in order to assess the temporal trend of year review themes over time. And this allowed us to quantitatively assess the way that different topics are waxing and waning. Uh, and we say that these attention scores are used to approximate the level of impact of these papers in the field, so you can interpret them that way. Uh, and finally, we performed a manual thematic review. So this thematic review validates our findings using the previous two approaches, using a qualitative approach where we manually review the themes in the paper. And so this is what the MeSH terms look like in the year in review corpus. Uh, the most uh, frequent terms are in the left-hand side of the screen. You can see, again, it's stuff that makes sense, including things like algorithms, computational biology, um, some things that are a little bit more uh, informatic general, and not just TBI, things like databases, um, things like that. And then on the right-hand side, something slightly more interesting that tells us a little bit more about the actual year in review process. So we're, sh we're showing the frequencies of MeSH terms in year and review articles compared to non-year and review articles. And so these are the ones that stand out the most. Uh, and the interesting portions that we'd like to highlight in that are the bottom three uh, bars, which correspond to molecular sequence data, mice, and animals. So what that means is that these are terms that were substantially depleted in year and review articles when compared to articles sourced from the same sets of journals. And that's really interesting. It partially validates uh, this approach because mice and animals are two things that were intentionally disclude, uh, uh, excluded from the year in review doc documents. So intentionally, Dr. Altman and the people who were doing the manual curation would ignore papers if they did not describe human experiments. And so I'm going to formalize this thing that we call bursts. But first, I want to show you that the different topics that are important in the year in review corpus tend to have these trends where they wax and wane over time, like I said. Uh, you can see that some of the trends are pretty static. So for example, the two very bright bars in the center are single nucleotide polymorphism and genomics, which are things that have been around in informatics for quite a while, and they were popular when they came out, and they're still popular. Other things show rather interesting trends. The very bottom row is, says metagenome. So you can see that it was uh, there was no activity because metagenome was not defined yet, and then there was a quick burst of popularity of starting in about 2010, and then the interest seemed to wane off. So we used this in a formalized framework to analyze the data, like I said. And we do that using an algorithm called Kleinberg's algorithm for bursty streams. And so when we talk about streams, a stream is some stream of information, and in this case, mesh terms are the streams. So there are sequences of documents that are annotated with that mesh term, delineated by the time gaps between those publications. And so a burst is a time range when many of those mesh terms appear together frequently. And then these can be hierarchically structured. So in other words, you can have a burst within another burst, which is kind of interesting. And the level of burstiness can be approximated using the state of a hidden Markov model. So this is what the algorithm briefly looks like. If you want more details, you can read the paper. But essentially what we have is we have n plus 1 events over a certain period of time, t. And then we have these two vectors called x and q. And this is for each mesh document. The x is the time gaps between those different documents. And the state sequence q is telling you the level of burst that is currently occurring. And then you want to find the state sequence that minimizes some cost function. So this is what it looks like schematically. Uh, as you can see, we refer to the period before any burst as a pre-burst period, and then the burst period is when any sort of burst is occurring, and then this period afterwards, if it exists, is called the post-burst period. So we computed this for each of the, each of the mesh terms that were in the, both the year and review document set and the uh, background document set, 
And we use those uh, in conjunction with these altmetric attention scores to learn uh, different temporal trends that were occurring over time. So like I said, attention scores aggregate various measures of media attention and scientific attention. So it includes both layperson uh, attention to these documents as well as scientific attention. And what we did was we looked at documents in the year in review corpus in the time periods relative to these births. So either before the burst, which is indicated with the blue lines in this figure, during the burst, which is the, the red line, and then the green line is post-burst, so after a post occurred. And the way that we interpret this is if a topic has a rightward trend over time in terms of attention, then that means that the topics became more impactful after they were well known. If they had a leftward trend instead, we interpreted that as early articles that were pre presented in the year in review were the most impactful. So they were things that probably incited or were part of the, uh, the phenomenon that resulted in these to become popular in the first place. So as an example, you can see that the year in review articles on algorithms are more popular. They became more popular after people, or more impactful, I guess, than after they became popular overall. And so this is an example of a rightward trend. So you can see the statistical models uh, become more impactful as time goes on past this burst period. And computer simulation has the opposite trend. Uh, and we'd like to point out that in these images, the, the uh, interquartile ranges are very large, so we don't want to overinterpret them. So there's a lot of overlap in these. But we can still see that there are some trends occurring. So I briefly mentioned that we also explored, using logistic regression, the importances of mesh terms in relation to these year in review documents. So what we wanted to do is not to predict whether a paper was year in review or not year in review, but instead we wanted to see where they're important. So when we run this logistic regression classifier with um, L1 regularization, we end up with these being the beta coefficients that are returned that are non-zero. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see some mesh terms that are predictive, essentially, of a year in review article. On the right column, you see mesh terms that are anti-predictive, or uh, if you see that in the classification task, it means that it's probably uh, less likely to be a year in review article. Now, there's some really interesting things that we saw in this. So uh, the, the left corner, the left side is actually pretty, um, it's things that we would expect to see. So genome, obviously, is something that's relevant to translational bioinformatics. But when we look at the anti-predictive terms, we see things like reproducibility of results, which is something that we really push in this field. So is this something that we're missing out on? Additionally, gene expression studies, cohort studies, and gene expression profiling are things that tend to be pretty central to this field. So we're wondering what causes this. Is this something that is engineered into the process? Is it an artifact of the data? Or is it something that we can actually leverage to learn more about how we can highlight important topics in the future? So based on these results, we wanted to check to see if they were just an artifact of the data that we had. And we did that using this manual thematic review. So what we did is we picked uh, 33 articles uh, at random. And we balanced these between the background and the year in review, as you can see in the left-hand side of this Sankey diagram, where the year in review is the orange documents and the blue is the background documents, and performed manual coding of these terms using uh, the NVivo software. And so what you would want to see, this is a very busy figure, but it, what you want to look at is essentially the traffic going in and out of these uh, columns, or these rows that are on the right-hand side. So here's two that are particularly illustrative of what we were noticing and things that validated the previous data we had. So you can see here background, and whoops, you can see background and year in review is, should be in approximately that proportion, but in precision medicine, you can see that year in review documents are substantially overrepresented compared to the background documents. And you can also see the opposite pattern occurring in gene expression. And these are two terms that showed up in both the mesh article and in our, um, uh, or in the mesh analysis as well as the altmetric score analysis as being sort of opposing, talking about the themes that are present in these, uh, in these two corpuses of documents, year in review and non-year in review. So again, we saw that gene expression is for some reason uh, skewed away from uh, the year in review and is more prevalent in the background documents. So how do we interpret these data? So we want to look at certain topics that are well covered by year in review and we found that they can be impactful early or late with respect to bursts in those topics. So there's several that are highly impactful pre-burst, there's several that are highly impactful post-burst, and then there's some that the impact tends to be irrespective of the burst state. Um, 
Intentional design choices that were engineered into the year reviews are preserved in our analysis results, and that comes back to this uh, mice and animal thing, so that helps validate that what we're doing is actually showing characteristics of the data that are meaningful. Also, year review papers tend to have mesh annotations that align with translational research. That's something we hope to see and it's something we did observe. And that year in review is ahead of the curve on some topics but behind on others. So we want to explore this and see what those are. Uh, so just moving on quickly before I wrap it up to the future directions, we want to analyze co-author net networks in the year in review data because this is another area of data that could tell us about what's going on. So are certain author groups overrepresented? And we have this data available from the Scopus API. We also want to look at other AMIA year in reviews. Um, and we want to formalize the concepts of leading and lagging within the existing algorithmic framework. Finally, we want to determine, are the year in review sessions influential? <laughs> so I'm just going to wrap up by saying that we, um, the authors of this paper consisted of many AMIA students and one faculty member who is a member of the Translational Bioinformatics and Genomics Working Group. And so being a student member, we're trying to find other collaborations between AMIA student members and experts in other working groups. So please, um, please uh, keep your eye on what we're doing in the student working group. We'd love to collaborate with people from other interests. So just uh, my acknowledgments, I'd like to thank the co-authors of this paper who are listed on the screen. Russ Altman for giving these great year in review presentations for us to analyze. All of the TBI year in review student volunteers, Altmetric for giving me access to their API. The U.S. National Library of Medicine for providing the mesh annotation. And then Nicholas Tatnetti, my advisor, for providing financial support. So thanks very much. Thank you. We have a little bit of time for questions. We have time for two questions. And this is a paper that you can download on the conference proceedings if you'd like to read. Yes? Did you have any thoughts about how this insight could be useful in, in the future? Yeah, so, well, there's a lot of things we don't know yet, but when we see that there are certain terms that are underrepresented, things like reproducibility of results, that's something that we really want to push. So if it's something that we know is being underrepresented in the highlights of our field, then we can use that as a lesson to move forward and say, listen, we should be uh, maybe encouraging this more, directing more funding into these areas, highlighting papers about this better. So are we, for some reason, biased against them? So I think that that's going to be the best area of developing new and more impactful research in translational bioinformatics. And I'd also like to point out that this framework could be used for other branches of informatics and other areas of science as well, if we have the appropriate data to support it. The reason why did, we did TBI was because we had the data and we're all translational bioinformatics. Uh, specialists, so uh, we think that it could be useful in many contexts. With respect to the mesh annotations, um, what's the range of numbers of annotations per article to find mesh? It varies. I know that a lot of them that I look at tend to have somewhere in the neighborhood of five to seven. I'd say that's pretty average for a paper that is published in a well-covered <coughs> journal. Uh, some have fewer. Some actually have none because they either haven't been annotated yet or due to some other reason. And there's other things that you can keep in mind, like there's subterms or secondary terms, so these are other things we could look at. But yeah, it's usually about five per article, five to seven, I would say. And that's relatively constant. Thank you. Thank you.